Notice on the screen where we are going to be this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Give you a moment to turn there if you choose to use your Bible. I'll put everything on the screen for us as usual. The Bible says of Jesus in the night of his betrayal, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, or you could say sealed by my blood. But notice the central theme. He's talking about the new covenant. Now what that term means is what we're going to continue to talk about here this morning. This is our third message on this theme. Uh, a covenant, I hope you remember, is an arrangement. You could say it's a design or a protocol for living out one's life based on the idea of an agreement and promise. Think of marriage, that's the illustration that I've used. Uh, two people decide to get married. They agree that they want to spend the rest of their lives together. So they come together, they have a, a essential form of agreement. They agree to grow in love, to stay true and faithful until death they do part. And then they stand before God and, and his people and they say, I do, I do, I promise that I do is essentially a promise that I will do as we agreed. We will live together and love one another. So that's the idea of a covenant. Marriage is indeed a covenant. Now, that understood, what we've seen is this. The Bible teaches there is an old covenant and a new covenant. Here's the old covenant. It's God's arrangement to live with him based on moral law and one's religious performance. It's performance based. That's what you need to remember about the new or the old covenant or the old protocol or the old design. It's performance based. On the other hand, the new covenant is God's arrangement to live with him, to walk with him on the basis of his love, his mercy, and his grace alone. And that's important. That's why I underlined it. Grace alone. Grace, remember, always means that God is the one who does the work in our behalf. And so living in the new covenant is the idea of depending on and trusting in our Lord for absolutely everything. Everything. Let me put it this way. This is the new covenant in capsule form. Nothing coming from me. Everything coming from God. That's the framework of of this. This is the, the way to think about this concept. I'll give you a, a, a scripture reference later to validate this. Colossians 2 6 is uh, another text that helps us to understand. Paul says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive him? By grace alone. You put your faith in Christ alone, you turn from your sin and yourself, and you put your confidence, your trust in Christ. Now, on that basis, you were made alive to God. We call it being born again. Now that you've done that, continue to do it. Every step, every step. Walk in Him. Nothing coming from me. Everything coming from God. Here's Paul's testimony that is a good illustration. Colossians 1, 28, he says, So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God 
perfect in their relationship to Christ. And look at this. That's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Do you see it? Uh, this is not a lazy life. Paul says, I work and struggle hard, but every step I take, I am depending on the mighty power of Jesus Christ to work in me and through me. That's the idea that we want to convey. Now, here's what I know for sure as I look out on all of you sitting here this morning. You are either living out your life on the basis of the old covenant, the old protocol, or you are presently living out your life on the basis of this new arrangement, this new covenant lifestyle. You are either thinking, if it is to be, it's up to me, I must... I must make it all happen. It's about me. Or you are thinking like Paul here in Colossians 29, 129. He says, I'm working, but, but I'm not counting on myself. My trust is in the person of Jesus Christ within me. Or factor in Philippians 4.13. You know it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the idea. Here's uh, the amplified translation of Philippians 4.13. It's helpful. Paul says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ sufficiency. That's the idea. I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency for everything. That's new covenant thinking. Now, let me show you a paragraph here by Christian writer Stephen Ziesler. He writes this, the universal experience of human beings is the old covenant. We are all born into it. It operates in both the secular and the religious world. And it is the one that seems so normal to us that we very often can imagine another. Life proceeds on this bargain. Performance leads to reward. Failure leads to rejection and punishment. You're paid off for how well you do, how good you look, your success in understanding what's valued, your ability to control your own destiny, your ability to beat the competition. This arrangement applies everywhere. Economics, athletics, international relations, the social order of the local junior high, relationships among siblings, brothers and sisters, it is everybody's common experience. Sadly, it's true of most religious experience as well. Most people wish for more from God. But practically speaking, when they consider religion, in other words, when they look at the church, they discover, or at least they are led to think that apparently God rewards ethical performance. They are led to believe good people are his favorites and status within the religious community is always gained by religious achievement. On the other hand, when we understand the full implications of the new covenant, we discover the most liberating secret in the word of God. And I actually agree with that statement. It's not overkill. In fact, I was thinking this past week, if I had one message to share with Christians, it would be 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This message. Because this message is God's strategy for all of us. He wants us to learn to live out our lives relating to him walking with him, serving him, 
and always on the basis of his love and his grace. He wants us to be motivated by his love and his grace. Here it is. God's arrangement to live with him, walk with him on the basis of his love, mercy, and grace alone. Or nothing coming from me, everything coming from God. Now, of course, trust is coming from me, but I am counting on him to supply me with what I need. It's always God doing the work. In John chapter 6, there were some religious Pharisees. They came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, what can we do to do the works of God? And here's what he said. This is the work of God that you believe on him who he has sent, Jesus. You know, when you think about that question, it's almost preposterous. What can I do to do the work of God? You can't do the work of God. How insulting to God to assume that you can. Only God can do his work. But if we are of a mind to trust him, and if we'll look to him and not ourselves, God will do his work in us and through us. And it will be an amazing thing to behold. Now, let me have you look again this morning at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and following. You, you may remember this chapter is Paul's response to the Corinthians, some of whom were questioning his, his authority as an apostle. They were saying Paul doesn't have a valid ministry, even though he's the guy who went to Corinth in Acts 18 and he stayed there a year and a half preaching day in and day out and he is the one who led these people to Christ and now they've turned against him. We don't need Paul anymore. He's unnecessary. In fact, false teachers came through and they began to put Paul down. So now they're questioning him and he's responding to that. Look at this. Are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others who need to bring you letters of recommendation or who ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. The only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves. Your lives are a letter in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing, notice, the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. In other words, it's all the work of God, but it's through our ministry, he's saying. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. Now, verse 4 is important. Four and five. He says, we are confident of all of this. That is, all the work of God that has taken place through him. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. Not our trust in self, but in him through or on the merit of Christ. Verse five, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. I pointed out last week the word qualified is also translated adequate or competent. So he's saying it's not that we think we're competent or qualified or adequate to do anything on our own. Our qualification, our competency comes from God. Verse 5 is where we get nothing coming from me. You see it? Everything coming from God. It's right there. Nothing coming from me. We're not qualified, but God is. So we're looking away from ourselves to him. Look at verse 6. He continues. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. There's the term. This is a covenant, not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, 
But under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. Now, when he says here, the old covenant ends in death, he means by that condemnation. The reason is because when you try to keep the old covenant on your own terms and in yourself, you're always going to fail. So the same covenant that commands you will in effect kill you with condemnation. In fact, in the King James Version, it's put that way. Notice, the letter kills. The letter meaning the old way, the old arrangement, the old covenant. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. What does it kill? It kills motivation. It's, I'm talking about legalism. That's really the old covenant. It kills morale. It kills, it kills hope. It kills dreaming. It kills confidence. It kills morale in a congregation. Wherever legalism is at work, wherever the letter is, is held to or embraced, wherever the old covenant is being uh, committed to or submitted to, you will find that there is a lot of death in that place, a lot of condemnation, uh, and a very low morale among the people. Look at verse 7. He continues. The old way with laws etched in stone. You can see he's alluding to that old covenant. It led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. So he's talking here about Moses when he received the law of God uh, codified in the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone. I'll, I'll talk more about this in a little bit. Look at verse 8. He says, <clears throat> the old covenant, the glory was fading, he then says, verse 8, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Question he's raising, and the answer is absolutely. If the old way which brings, there it is, condemnation. If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God. In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced, we have to get that. The old covenant has been replaced, but if it was glorious to some degree, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever. Now, the next verse is like a summary statement. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. So notice, this is where real confidence is coming from for Christians. It's the new way. It's the new covenant. And you can easily see why one would have confidence because it's not up to me to make it happen. It's up to God. I just need to show up and trust him and he does the work. Now, if I'm counting on myself, my confidence will be in my ability, but my ability will only take me so far. It's very limited. But if I'm trusting in God, man, there are no walls that I can't penetrate there are no barriers that you can't overcome. I mean, the, the whole world is open to you if your confidence is in him. Now also, <clears throat> when he says here in verse 12, we can be very bold. I hope you remember from last week, I quoted from Thayer's Greek lexicon, the word for bold or very bold here means, or oh, it's the word parousia, parousia. And according to the lexicon, Thayer's lexicon, it means to be real, to be open, transparent, assured, free, without fear, without ambiguity, 
And so what he's saying is, this is the result of living your life in the new covenant. It's what we all want. But then comes verse 13. He brings up Moses again. He says, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. Now, the interesting thing here, as you begin to piece this story that he's talking about, as you begin to piece it together, what you find based on this passage, if you look also in Exodus 34, 35, Deuteronomy 5 through 9, here's the story, here's what happened. Moses was called of God to go to Mount Sinai. He went up on the mountain and he was there for a 40 day period of time. This actually happened twice, remember. But he's there on the mountain <clears throat> and after being in the very presence of God himself for that period of time, it caused his whole life to light up. I mean, he was... Uh, he, he was just radiating the glory of God. It was all over him. His, his face, he was shining brilliantly with radiant glory, the glory of God. So much so that when he came down from the mountain, now you have to imagine the people knew where Moses was. They knew he was there with God. So here he comes down the mountain you have to imagine they want to hear what he has to say. What did God say? Tell us. They're very anxious to hear. But when he comes from the mountain, all of a sudden he's lit up. And when they see him in that way, it causes them to become fearful, fearful, and they begin to withdraw. They can't look at him. It's so brilliant. So what Moses does is wear a veil. He puts a mask on so that he can now look into the eyes of the people and give them the message that God gave him. So there he is speaking to the people with this veil, this mask over his face. But here's the thing. With the passing of time, the glory that was on his face began to fade away more and more and more. Yet... He continued to wear the veil. The veil was covering him, but underneath there was no shine. There was no glory. He continued to wear the veil, even though the glory had fallen away or faded away. Which simply means that Moses wasn't being very parousia at all, was he? He wasn't being real and open and transparent and... Uh, free and without ambiguity. Here's the question. Why did he do this? Why did he wear the veil, the mask, even though the glory had faded away? Well, it seems to me the answer to that question is this. He did it out of fear. He was driven by fear. I think personally... It was fear of losing respect with the, the Jewish people, along with his place of prominence and authority over them. If you remember, this was a very stubborn, very prideful, stiff-necked group of people. They were always complaining, they were whining, always. And they had already, up to this point, given Moses a very, very difficult time. But here's the deal. When he had that veil on, he was the man. They were afraid of him. They, they did not dare try to fight against him. When he had that veil on, when his look was different, man, he was the guy that no one would trifle with. So what I'm saying is, he used this mask, this veil, 
in order to hide his own sense of fear and inadequacy. He used this mask in a way so as to project to others something that really wasn't true about himself. There was a guy back in the 1970s, back in the Jesus movement of that day. Uh, his name was John Fisher, and he wrote a song that is based on this chapter. Let me see where we're at. It's called, the title of the song is called Evangelical Veil Productions. And then he continues, pick one up at quite a reduction got all kinds of shapes and sizes, introductory bonus prizes, kind of a humorous deal, special quality, one-way see-through. You can see them, but they can't see you. Never have to show yourself again. Just released a Moses model, comes in shine, with shine in a plastic bottle. It makes you look like you've just seen the Lord. Just one daily application and you'll fool the whole congregation. Guaranteed to last a whole week through. And then, of course, you repeat the first verse and then everyone shouts, you're protected. There's one more verse. Got a back from the summer camp veil with a mountaintop look that'll never fail as long as you renew it year by year. Lots of special Jesus freak files Everyone comes with a permanent smile, one-way button, and a sticker for your car. <laughs> I understand what he's talking about. I remember those days, and I remember how it fit. You can, you know, you can make yourself look very different than you really are. And that's what he's talking about. Now, let me take you back to verse 13. Paul says, we are not like Moses, who put a veil, a mask over his face. We are not like Moses. I read that this week, and I question myself. I wonder if this is actually true of me, and is it true of you? Are we not like Moses? Moses, or does, like Moses, does fear drive us to hide in some way, to hide away ourselves, and then to wear a mask so as to project a, a, a type of message we want others to receive that makes us look good, that makes us look to have a little glory about it. Ray Stedman writes this, and I, I think this is helpful. He says, veils come in many forms today, but they are always essentially the same. An image or front we project to others and behind which we hide our real selves. They are always, therefore, a form of pride and hypocrisy. We don't want people to see our fading glory. And by wearing our veils long enough, there is actually the danger that we will actually begin to believe that we are the kind of people we want everyone to believe we are. Then our hypocrisy becomes unnoticed by us and its perpetuation is assured. Pride has a thousand faces. It is a master of disguise. To give you a better idea of this veil concept, think of self-righteousness. That's a mask. That's a veil. Someone might think of themselves as better than another person. And as a result, their attitude is, oh God, I'm glad I'm not as others are. But the truth is we're all the same. We've all come from the same mold, right? Some are more moldy than others, but <laughs> we're all the same. But self-righteousness projects an image that 
is attempting to convey that I'm different, I'm better than someone else. I think another common veil could be something like hypersensitivity or touchiness. You know some people, have you ever been around some people? They are so touchy. You, you, you have to be so careful that you don't say something that will offend them. Well, Ray Stedman has written about this as well. I like what he says. He says a really common Christian veil is sensitivity or touchiness. Persons who are touchy or excessively sensitive are easily hurt by the words or actions of others. They must be handled with kid gloves lest they take offense. And when offended, they suffer agonies of spirit and tend to wallow in self-pity for hours or even days on end. You know people like that? I, I know one here, I know, but I'm sure there are people in your sphere of friendships. Look at the rest of this. He says their explanation, of course, is always the thoughtlessness or rudeness of others but in reality, it is their own protest at not being given the attention or prominence which they feel certain they deserve. How about this? Being easily irritated or to frown quickly or to reply to others in a sharp manner is often a form of pride usually used to cover over one's insecurity or a deep sense of inferiority. Here's another. A habit of self-justification also reveals something similar. There are people who can't stand to be misunderstood. And so they are forever explaining their actions. They are really saying, I want you to think I'm really a perfect person. One more. The most common veil employed by Christians is remoteness. The practice of keeping our feelings and attitudes completely to oneself, even with friends or relatives. Remoteness arises primarily from fear. The fear of being known for what one is. Lastly, he gives an explanation. The veil represents a false sense of competence, power, authority, glory, and pride, which is used to cover one's fear and inadequacy. And frankly, folks, that is the reason behind all of the veils that people wear. And we've all done it. We've all done it. Now, to wrap this up, in verse 14, Paul is going to shift from Moses. He's going to talk now about the sons of Israel or the Israelites. And here's what he says. But the people's minds, uh, that the word people's minds is talking about the Jewish people. He says the people's minds were hardened. The Greek word here is the idea of scar tissue, scar tizo, which becomes increasingly insensitive the harder it gets. So the people's minds were like that, hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and, the, and they do not understand. Now the veil that he's talking about here, it's being used actually as a symbol of pride and unbelief. And I say that because when you go back to Exodus 34, uh, and over in Deuteronomy 5 through 9, this is where the Jews heard Moses as he gave the law. And after they heard Moses communicate to them 
God's law, their attitude was, all right, we'll do it. No problem, God. We will do all that you say we will do. That's a quote. That's exactly what they said. Here's the issue, however. They said we will happily do it, but in themselves, they weren't able to do it. They couldn't do it in themselves. But here's the thing. They wouldn't admit that. They wouldn't in any way admit to their failure. Their pride wouldn't allow it. Sound familiar? Paul is using this veil idea. He is saying the same veil of pride and unbelief is covering the hearts of Israel to, to his day. And frankly, I would tell you, it's still covering their hearts even to this day. You'll notice most of us here are not of the Jewish origin, right? I mean, we may have a couple folks here. I think we have one person in our congregation who's a completed Jew. We're, we're not. We're, uh, we're Gentiles. Something about it. Why, why is it such a problem for the Jews to come to the Christian faith? Well, let me show you something that I came across. This is actually a letter from a rabbi. And he talks in this letter, as he explains, he's talking about this attitude that is really what Paul is talking about in this text. Notice, we Jews have rejected the Gentile Christian view. Judaism, as shaped by our rabbis in Palestine, conceived of the body, that is our physical bodies, as a gift of God, and to this day we regard the body as holy and wholesome, not as a prison from which to escape. He then says, any inclination by man to commit a wrongdoing we hold resides not in his body, but in his heart or mind. And this inclination can be overcome by a change of heart or mind. Now look at the rest of this. Thus man by himself does possess indeed the power to atone for his own misdeeds. And we Jews have in our Torah, the law, the Old Testament is the Torah. We have the guidance directing our hearts and minds to righteous living. Do you see the attitude there? We don't need someone to atone for our sin. We do it ourselves. We don't need someone to help us in daily life. We live out of our own strength. It's about us. That's the old covenant in the Torah. And that's their attitude. But it's not only their attitude. Frankly, it's the attitude of most Gentiles today as well. Let me show you the solution. Verse 16. Paul says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That is, when someone turns in faith, the Lord takes that veil away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. This is going back to parousia, the idea. Of what does uh, he mean by parousia? He means freedom to be, freedom to triumph. Freedom to be transparent, open. And here he says, the Spirit of the Lord gives us freedom. Freedom to become. And then look at verse 18. He says, so all of us, all of us as Christians, all of us who have been made alive to God by the new birth, all of us have had that veil removed. Amen. And we notice the rest of it. We can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. We can exhibit a life like Moses to some degree. His glory faded. Our glory, we can see the Lord and 
And as a result of beholding the Lord, the glory of God will begin to show in our life. It will reflect change in our life. We can see and behold or reflect the glory of the Lord. We have that privilege. We can do that. Everyone who's a Christian can experience this and should. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Jesus, like Him, as we are changed into His glorious image. Wow. Now, this turning to the Lord here, I think, is very clear. It means turning away from yourself and what you're hiding and looking away only, only to the Lord Jesus himself. That's what he's talking about. Last week, I talked about two faces. There is the face of Moses and the face of Jesus. The face of Moses is an illustration of the Old Covenant. Remember, here is Moses on the right. He's holding the tablets of stone carved with the moral law of God. And he's pointing out the law and he's pointing his finger now at you because you've broken that law. You're under condemnation. Have you felt that in your life? Of course you have. But then there is the face of Jesus. Uh, I apologize. I looked everywhere to find inviting faces of Jesus. <laughs> but this is all I could find. Which I think is kind of an insight into the way that people might see him. It's like they see Jesus as this austere, cold-looking person, perhaps, examining every step that you take. Jesus is welcoming us, folks. He is accepting us through the finished work. He is loving us. He is desiring us. It's always a welcome. Always. That's the new covenant that has replaced the old, remember? The new covenant is a welcome mat. And the Lord is inviting us to come and live in his presence. And as we live in his presence, the glory that is on him will begin to be the glory that is on you to some degree. Ever increasing, ever increasing more and more from one degree of glory to another. It's like, you know, if you have a piece of steel and a magnet and you put that steel and the magnet together over an extended period of time, what happens to that piece of steel? It begins to take on the magnetism of the other, of the magnet. And that's the way it works in our life. As we live in His presence, as we gaze upon Him, as we view Him and understand Him, there is a transformation that is going to take place in our lives and we begin to reflect the very character, the very nature of Jesus himself. Here's what we have to do. Look away only to Jesus. And if you're sinking in the morass of this world, if you'll simply look away to Jesus today, you will find that he will take away that veil. If you want it, you have to want it. And if you'll look away to him alone, he will take that veil away and he will pull you up. He will pull you up. I, uh, I like this pick. This is one I did like. That guy's about to go down for the last time, isn't he? You know something about this. <laughs> Tom walked into my office, I don't know how many years ago, but probably about 20 now, in the grip of alcoholism ready to take the bridge. But he came into my office, I never knew him. And God saved him, turned his whole life around. Amen. You have to be willing to look into his face and you have to behold him with trust. And he'll pull you up out of that, out of that 
that world system in which is pulling away at us and pulling us down more and more and more. If you're today feeling, even as a believer, if you're feeling like you're, you're just losing it and you're slipping more and more, just look away to him. Look away. Look into his face today. It's a face of love and acceptance. It's a face of, of wanting you to come in and live in his presence. I, I was, Wednesday night, I was talking about our salvation and I made an illustration out of the story of the prodigal son. And in that story, you have this son who took his inheritance and went out and blew it all in pleasure seeking. He lived with prostitutes and the crowd that has no time for God. He was caught up in that world and he came to the end of himself so much so that he hated his life. And he said, I'm going to go home to my father. Maybe he'll let me work around the farm. Maybe he'll let me shovel something or do something like a slave. And he decided to go home. And when the father saw him, the Bible says, afar off, the father jumped up out of his seat. Now that's a little paraphrase of mine. <laughs> but he saw him and he ran to him as fast as he could. And the Bible says that he grabbed him and hugged him and started kissing his neck. Just kissing his neck. So happy to see my son has come home. He's home. And he just shows this bestowment of affection upon him. It's an unbelievable picture. But it's a picture of God. It's a picture of the living Savior who welcomes you and I to come. Come. And he will embrace you with that love that will transform your life. It's all about love, folks. It really is. It's about love. Unconditional love that is transforming. It's not about law. It's not about performance-based religion that is so everywhere, it's nauseating because it isn't the New Testament. It's about Christ and his love for you. And his love when he begins to work in you by his love and grace, he will actually change your heart so that you will change your behavior because of the work that he does inside of you. It's transformational. And my hope and prayer is today, you would stop where you're at and behold the face of Jesus. And look to him with a look of faith, with a look of repentance, a look of trust. No longer me, but it's him. And you watch what begins to unfold. It's a beautiful sight. And my hope is that you will have that experience. If you haven't already, my hope is that you will continue to relish the joy of being a part of the royal family of God. Pray with me then.